So we as human beings, uh, in our cognitive capacity, in our capacity as uh, conscious, knowing creatures, have innumerable beliefs about ourselves and about the world. Uh, if we are in a position like Descartes, where we generally, uh, and I'll use the word uh, for the first time, begin to be skeptical uh, about the truth of these beliefs, what do we do? Well, um, it's problematic. That is, uh, as we know, moving from belief or opinion to knowledge and truth about the world is exactly what this course really is about, and the problems associated with that. We started with that problem in the Mino, and we've continued to, to look at it. So we really think about, you know, what position are we in if we begin to be skeptical about the things that we believe? Because we believe so many things. And, and one of Descartes' sort of genius moves regard to all this, is to say, uh, you know, it's impossible to evaluate one's beliefs one at a time. That would be a lifetime's work and it would never be finished. So let's not do that because we have too many beliefs about the world and, and trying to sort them out in terms of their truth individually would be impossible. Uh, perhaps also we can add that it's also problematic because if we don't possess a criterion of truth in the first place, think of Texas Empiricus, uh, on what basis would we judge an individual truth or individual belief to be true or false in the first place? So maybe it's not only impossible to do in a lifetime, maybe it's just impossible to do at all because we have the right of truth. But Descartes suggests a method, a different part of his method, uh, to solve that problem, to say, you know, it's, get rid of it all, man. You know? That is... Don't go through your beliefs one by one to see which ones are doubtful or false or true. Um, get rid of all your beliefs at once. Start over. And it's the starting over that really is so strong a part of his personal narrative uh, and his uh, philosophy. In, in part two, he continually uses uh, architectural metaphors for the kind of thing that he's doing. Uh, begins to talk about buildings on page seven and generally works. He says, uh, now he says he, you know, he finally has some time. He's in this, in this stove, the famous stove heated room, you know, where he's in the winter quarters, I guess, of the army and he's got solitude and peace and he, he's going to do this thing where he looks within himself rather than anywhere in the world for the kind of answers that he seeks about what he really knows. He says, I was completely free, top page seven, I was completely free to converse with myself about my thoughts. Among them, one of the first was that it occurred to me to consider that there is often not so much perfection in works composed of many pieces and made by the hands of various master craftsmen as there is in those works on which but a single individual has worked. And he goes on and on really about, about this. Uh, Cities, uh, you know, and think of the cities of his time, 17th century, are really can be quite beautiful, but they're patchwork affairs. They're things that are almost by chance built up over time with no master plan. That would come later in city planning to you know, controversial results. But his general his general point seems to be that things that one person can work out from beginning to end are in a way going to be superior to those things that many people over long periods of time have put together in a sort of patchwork way. And that may or may not be true. And certainly, look at the world, figure that out for yourself. I don't know. But that is the metaphor that, that he uses to describe what he will be doing. He says on page nine, my plan has never gone beyond trying to reform my own thoughts uh, and building upon a foundation which is completely my own. To reform all of his thoughts, to build to, to build a new foundation. You know, that is realizing that if, if, if his beliefs and, and opinions are shaky, it's because they 
do not rest on a solid foundation. And it's the, he's got to raise the whole building, so to speak. He's got to tear it all down. And again, not piece by piece, not belief by leap, belief, but by just ripping it all down at once, saying I, I, I reject everything that I thought I knew. And starting over, building on a new foundation, Again, for instance, on the bottom of page nine, mentioning again custom and example. Thus, it is more custom and example that persuades us than any certain knowledge. Suspicion that he believes things on inadequate evidence. So, what will uh, you know? How will he start over? What will he use as his new way of you know of gaining knowledge? And here, his experience as a mathematician becomes crucial. Uh, I'm not a mathematics person. I do not understand very much in mathematics. But one of the things we should keep in mind is that Descartes was an incredibly important mathematician as well as an incredibly important philosopher. Pretty rare, actually. Somebody is really a central figure in, in, in two fields. Like that, I think. Uh, but anybody, you know, if, if you've uh, done, uh, you know, the uh, you know, the Cartesian coordinate thing, you, you know, you've been influenced by Descartes, right? And uh, he refers to his <laughs> mathematical training and his mathematical uh, work. He mentions on page 10, logic, geometrical analysis, and algebra, which were, you know, developed the mathematical fields at the time. Geometry was the legacy of the ancient world. Euclid, great geometers, other many, many geometers in the ancient world. And algebra was the new, the new science of analysis that had been passed on by the Arab world, Muslim civilizations. Europeans were beginning to add to it and reconceive it. And uh, he, you know, did really important work in mathematics, he's a mathematical genius, really. You know, his method, which he describes on page 11, is really a borrowing of his method for finding truth in mathematics. He did find truth in some important problems. So let's take a look at the four rules that he mentions on page 11. Says, I believed that the following four rules would be sufficient for me, provided I made a firm and constant resolution not even once to fail to observe them. First, what I think is the most crucial one, Now, this is the method as I take it, this is the method that's advertised in, in the title of the work. He says, the first was never to accept anything as true that I did not plainly know to be such. That is to say, carefully to avoid hasty judgment and prejudice and to include nothing more in my judgments than what presented itself to my mind so clearly and so distinctly that I had no occasion to call it in doubt. In a way, just a harmless rule, a reminder that we need to be clear about what we know uh, and to and when, we're doing, when we're doing something that we feel is important to, to make sure that we're certain of both our premises and the conclusions that we draw from our premises. So as a rule of thumb, it's harmless. As a philosophical principle, it's filled with paradox. And I think that uh, we're in a position to see just how paradoxical it is. And in a way, evaluating Descartes is, a, I think, evaluating to what extent he acknowledges the paradoxes that are brought up by his principles and, and to what degree he resolves them. So we're going to have to take another look at uh, part two in the next video.